uh, first off, uh, Rafiq, uh, I would really like to thank you uh, and the Syrian Association for Citizens' Dignity, the European Institute of Peace, not only for the kind invitation, but also for the what I truly believe is is groundbreaking uh, and prescient work. You guys have been ahead of the curve, uh, and the work that you do on concepts such as the safe environment. Uh, has been has been really important. I hope that in Europe you're getting all the support that you need, because the work that you you're doing is uh, uh, this thinking outside the box, this creative thinking is uh, something that we absolutely need. Uh, so the view, of course, I'm going to address your question regarding the bill, but I think I need to maybe describe the overall picture, uh, and maybe share with you a little bit about the view that we have, uh, the view from Washington D.C., the view. Uh, you know, from from across the pond. Uh, so, if if you were to ask, if you were to reach out uh, to the State Department in the in Foggy Bottom, uh, and to ask what is uh, U.S. policy towards Syria at the moment, uh, they would say uh, we have not changed our Syria policy. Uh, Syria policy remains the same. Uh, we're not going to be normalizing ties with the Assad regime, nor are we going to be lifting sanctions uh, on, on the regime. If you reach out to DOD, the Department of Defense, they would also tell you that they're still committed to the mission in northeastern Syria, that they have no plans for withdrawing troops from, from nor northeastern Syria. So I think that would be true. These responses you would get would be true, but... Uh, and here comes our critique of, uh, and by our, I mean the Syrian American communities critique of US policy. I think that would be true, but not entirely accurate. Why? So uh, we would contend, our contention is that there actually has been a shift in, uh, in, in US policy. And we uh, observed the shift uh, a little over two years ago. Uh, U.S. policy used to be, uh, uh, we're not going to normalize ties with the regime. And if you're an ally of the United States, if you're an Arab country, and you take steps towards normalization, uh, then, hello, we have sanctions on the books, and you're, you're going to be liable. Uh, that changed uh, to, we're not going to normalize ties with the regime, but should you make the sovereign decision to normalize ties with the regime, this is your business. And maybe while at it, maybe you can get something. So this transactionality was introduced, uh, and I think that's why we have this uh, Arab initiative at the moment, Arab track at the moment, in the moment, and the decision is to give this Arab track a chance, uh, you know, with the hope that maybe it'll produce, it will produce some, uh, some results. Now, of course, this was deeply concerning to our community. Uh, and, uh, and that's, uh, that's when our organizations, uh, I, I work for uh, the, the Syrian American Council, which is the uh, oldest and largest organization representing Syrian Americans. Uh, but I also work for the American Coalition for Syria, and that's an umbrella of eight different organizations that coordinate their work uh, in Washington, D.C. So all these organizations and others, uh, about two years ago, uh, when we noticed that shift in policy, we uh, we went to Congress because you know the good the good and the bad news uh, from you know from the United States is that we have divided government. It's good news, it's bad news, but it's also good news because we have divided government. Uh, that means no one uh, single entity or branch of the U.S. government uh, can make all the decisions or 100% of the decisions. And as you know, Congress has the constitutional uh, right and responsibility to exercise oversight over the federal government. So our community expressed those concerns uh, to lawmakers in Congress on a bipartisan basis, and that, which means the Republicans and Democrats at the same time. And lawmakers initially gave uh, the federal government, uh, because we know we had a new boss in town, we had a new administration in town, so lawmakers gave this new administration a chance, grace period. Uh, but then uh, they, there was alignment 
uh, there was an alignment between our position and the lawmakers' position, and they started expressing those concerns to the federal government. Uh, until a decision was made that lawmakers were not happy with the direction that American policy was taking, and they decided to take matters into their own hands. Uh, since then, American lawmakers from both parties, Democrats and Republicans, have gone on the record over six different times in the House and in the Senate, uh, basically uh, uh, stating their opposition to uh, this tolerance of normalization or tacit green light that was given to normalization and clearly expressing uh, where they believe Syria policy should be headed. So now I can say that this opposition or this new position uh, has solidified in, in Washington, D.C. There is overwhelming uh, support for a vision of Syria policy that does not uh, support uh, you know, normalization, that says that so long as atrocities and war crimes and other violations persist, that sanctions will not be lifted. Uh, um, among other things. And the bill that you asked me about, the Assad regime anti-normalization bill, was one of the more recent examples because when it passed the House, uh, it passed with, with uh, 389 votes. Uh, the, the bill had uh, 52 uh, co-sponsors, original co-sponsors, Democrats and Republicans. And then when it, came, when it was uh, put on the floor for a vote, it garnered 389 uh, votes, uh, affirmative votes. Uh, versus 32, uh, 32 uh, nays only, uh, so that, uh, an overwhelming majority. And actually, just a few days ago, uh, uh, we were successful in also adding a new amendment to uh, the Department of Defense, the NDA, the National Defense Authorization Act, uh, regarding both normalization, uh, two, two different amendments regarding both normalization, but also regarding captive money. So now on the books, we have three different pieces of legislation regarding Captagon, something that the administration also neglected in the past. And that's, you know, when lawmakers, our community uh, in partnership with lawmakers uh, stepped up and uh, uh, crafted, crafted policy that made it incumbent on the Fed, uh, American federal government to take on this issue. Uh, about a month ago, uh, Captagon 2, that's a second piece of legislation regarding uh, dismantling the regime's drug network networks, uh, uh, was passed. And just a few days ago, we had a new amendment that uh, basically, add, th this new amendment asked the Department of Defense to step up its efforts regarding the combating of, of this trade and to treat it as a national security threat. So uh, to sum up, to sum up, uh, I think now there is an alternative official uh, voice in DC uh, that is bipartisan, uh, and that includes the president's party, the Democratic Party, uh, that is not entirely pleased with the fact that the administration has sort of like deprioritized Syria over the past two years and, you know, uh, gave. Turn, turn the blind eye, let's say, to, to normalization. Uh, and that has been clearly expressed to the administration. Initially, it was through tweets and statements, but then uh, through letters to uh, Secretary Blinken and, and the Secretary of Defense, uh, and, uh, and then through letters to President Biden, and then through six different pieces of legislation in just uh in just 18 uh in just uh, 18 to 19 months so that is very very significant and our community in the united states it would be no exa exaggeration to say that our community and our organizations have been at the forefront of this legislative very active legislative movement i'll conclude here uh with an example so uh after the earthquake uh the united states to facilitate the delivery of humanitarian assistance, et cetera, uh, issued General License 23. And General License 23 was a blanket general license that basically operated on the honor system. Uh, you know, all you had to do was to basically make, stake the claim that a, a particular transaction was gonna be carried out for humanitarian reasons. 
uh, and you were covered under the general general license 23 and it was issued for six months uh of course sadly the the license was was abused and so there were some people in washington dc who wanted to extend that license for two years and lawmakers were swift from both parties to speak up on that and to say absolutely not uh so the state department had to reach out to lawmakers to uh share with them that general license 23 was not going to be to be renewed uh so here the point that i would uh maybe encourage our european colleagues to take into consideration is that what we're working on in the united states should be actually welcomed as leverage we are not interested in perpetuating uh, the deadlock in Syria. And the work that we do is not because we simply just want to exact punishment uh, on the regime. Uh, that is, that's not what we have in mind. But what we have in mind is building leverage for Syrian and American and European negotiators. Uh, you may recall that the, uh, you know, the, secretary, the, the special envoy of the Secretary General uh, the office was created about 10 years ago, and over 10 years they've been trying to produce any progress, and they have not been able to produce any progress because the regime has been very intransigent. So uh, uh, in order to get any meaningful concessions from the regime, you need leverage. To go to the regime without leverage, uh, you're going to get nothing, right? So we're trying to build that leverage, and we're saying that uh, uh, for con you know, concessions can be made, but in return for measurable progress. And we haven't seen, uh, we have not seen that yet. So I hope that in Europe, these efforts that we've undertaken, I hope that they will be welcomed and seen in the right context. And this right context is, uh, we still have hundreds of thousands of people in, in, in jail. Uh, half the population is displaced. So we want to ensure that uh, American negotiators, European negotiators, and you know, for, first and foremost, Syrian negotiators have the leverage they need in 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 uh, in in this process. And so, everything we do is within this framework. Uh, let me ask you then another question, which will take uh, two hours to answer. Uh, how uh, do you see uh, the possibility? Does it exist uh, that we be able to move U.S. policy? beyond uh, what is, uh, like you said, basically uh, trying to, to, to contain uh, normalization in some way, dealing with what are clearly interests of Europe and the West, and that is curbing the captagon trade and towards, for instance, elevating the establishment of the safe environment to the top of the political agenda. Mm -hmm. So that, that uh, uh, we are dealing with uh, solutions rather than just simply trying to stop the leaks in in mm -hmm. the sinking ship okay i uh, so i'll you know i'll be i'll be frank uh u.s policy over the past two years towards the entire region towards the entire middle east has been one of conflict management not conflict resolution uh and th that emanated from a desire uh, the president did not want to be consumed uh, by Middle East crises. So when he, uh, uh, so after he won, he gave a very clear direct directive to uh, uh, to his staff that he he'd rather not be, uh, you know, bothered every single day by wars and problems in the Middle East. So the pro so that the policy that was designed or the strategy that was designed on that basis was one. Uh, that really sought to ameliorate conditions, uh, you know, provide humanitarian assistance, uh, maintain conflict, current conflict lines. Uh, so really, conflict, the, you know, management of the symptoms of the con conflicts generally across the region, uh, in addition to working on the Ab Abrahamic Accords, etc. But not one that wanted to really contend with uh, the root cause of, of these issues and, and work on addressing uh, these issues at, 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 at their core. Uh, Syria was no, was no exception. So uh, the policy that they uh, introduced or they adopted was also one of conflict management. So uh, because of that, Syria generally was not prioritized. You know, uh, we always say personnel is policy. And uh, 
we saw a market uh, decrease in the number of personnel allocated to the Syria portfolio uh, at the State Department, at the Treasury Department, and, and elsewhere. Uh, so I do not think that we are on the cusp of major rejuvenation of that thinking. Uh, the, just, how would you then respond to what uh, Dr. Tami was saying? As far as as far as he believes that they will be oh so 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 I, actually, I, so, so I actually I so so I actually so I actually I don't know about a shakeup, but I actually agree with him that Syria is going to force itself on onto the American agenda simply because this policy of conflict management that I just yeah you know it was has completely it is completely blown up. Uh, our national security advisor had an op-ed in uh, Foreign Affairs that came out on October 7th that said the Middle East is the quietest it has ever been. Of course, that had to, you know, in the print version, it's still there, but the online version, that had to be changed, right? So this policy proved, proved to be ineffective. Uh, you do need to address uh, problems at their cores, and Syria is no exception. So I agree with Dr. Taqi that eventually, Syria is going to force itself onto the American agenda, and I, and I think we've seen we're seeing some of that, uh, you know, uh, uh, underway anyway. But in terms of Ameri American uh, policymakers, at least within the federal, uh, uh, the executive branch of government, uh, uh, do I think that they're on the cusp of uh, pursuing a different approach to Syria at the moment? No. Now, however, our representatives uh, from our community. Recently, uh, they engaged both campaigns, the Biden campaign and the Trump campaign. And there was recently a meeting in uh, Michigan uh, between between our community and and the the, the the Trump campaign. And we we have the sense that you know should there be a change change of guard in in the United States that there would be a different approach. And maybe that's something I can uh, you know address later. So no, I don't I don't think we're on the on 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 the cusp. But uh, I I think. Slowly but surely, they will come to this realization. They've been trying to avoid this problem. We, they tried that under the Obama administration. It completely failed, spectacularly failed. I think they tried to do that over the past two years, and it has not been uh, effective. So eventually, I think they're going to have to contend with the fact that uh, you, you do need a different uh, approach.